Good morning, church. He is risen. Praise God. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're joining us online, thank you as well for joining us. We're so glad to have you with us. Why don't we all stand together and worship this amazing God who nailed our sins to the cross? When I stand accused by my regrets And the devil roars his empty threats I will preach the gospel to myself That I am not a man condemned For Jesus Christ is my defense My sin is nailed to the cross My soul is healed Scotty Schaefer, and now I'm in the sixth grade. You may be seated. And today I have a friend with me. Thanks for being my friend. I'm Pastor Craig, and it's good to have you all here worshiping with us. And I'll say it again He is risen. Yeah. All right, it's great to hear that response. Uh, once again, we want to give a welcome to our online friends. If you're watching online, be sure and drop a comment or something so that we know that you're there. And we look forward to worshiping with you. Uh, 
uh, live and in person at some point in the future. Uh, if people are new here, and there's a good chance on Easter there might be people that are new here, where should they go? Go to myclc.info. myclc.info forward slash new here. You can find out all kinds of information about the church, and you're also welcome to ask questions uh, anytime. We'd love to guide you uh, to information about who we are as a family here. A um, couple of other announcements. First of all, New Life Sunday. We're really excited about this. This is going to be May 1st. We do a couple things on New Life Sunday. We dedicate children to the Lord, and we have baptism. And so if you are one uh, and you're a follower of Jesus and you are interested in being baptized, we would love to baptize you. We would love to have you be a part of New Life Sunday. Um, our deadline for kind of signing up for that is this week. And so uh, you're welcome to uh, check out some more information about that over in the foyer area here uh, after the service. And But we would love to have you be a part of that. So if you have any questions, like I said, you can always approach me, Pastor Gordon, uh, Nicole, any of the others, and we'll be glad to direct you to where you need to be um, to uh, sign up for that or uh, ask more questions about that. The other thing is we are having an indoor yard sale slash rummage sale here down in the basement on Saturday. Now we've put this off on purpose, uh, telling people about this too much because people would want to bring all their stuff too early and we didn't want it too early. Starting tomorrow, if you want to contribute anything, you're going to clean out that basement or whatever, contribute anything to our rummage sale, you can bring that into the church all week and we will be storing it downstairs and then you can contribute that way, or you can show up and buy more junk or other people's junk on Saturday and take it home. Uh, and all the proceeds uh, help us out with sending our young people to camp. Are you going to camp? Yeah. I forgot to ask you about this. You were baptized on New Life Sunday last year? Yes. All right, how'd that go? Good. Good, <laughs> good. Mm -hmm. So he recommends both, the sale and New Life. Uh, New Life Sunday. So you can bring stuff in all week for our sale and then please uh, feel free to stop by on Saturday. Um, so if they want info on all this stuff, where do they go? Go to myclc.info. Myclc.info has all kinds of information as well as online uh, or uh, social media, um, our newsletter, but myclc.info has a plethora of information about what's going on here at the church. Uh, if you are going to share your giving, your, your financial giving this morning, we have ways to do that. We have baskets up here in front. You can bring your gifts up during this next song. You can go online and give online. You can text to give. There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, so feel free uh, to do that as we continue to worship. Now what? Please stand. Jesus, we worship you. Our hearts reach out to you as we sing. Let us praise you. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the creation you did not despise a cross 
For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus, for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Majesty Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth the whole shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected. from Romans 7, 21 through 25. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am, who will free me from this life that I have dominated by sin and death. Thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Now will you please pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for allowing us to come together today and worship you. Thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for us. We gather here to celebrate you, dying for our sins so that we can live the lives we're living today. Please focus our mind on the message that Pastor Gordon is preparing for us. Open up our hearts and guide us as we continue on this day. You are a savior and we are forever grateful. We ask this in your precious name, amen. You may now be seated. If you've ever gone hiking before, especially in the winter, you know that breaking trail is something you do when you encounter deep snow that's tough to navigate. When that happens, one hiker usually goes ahead of their group and clears the way so others can follow behind more easily. A trail breaker is someone who goes ahead, who makes a new way, who invites others to follow along behind them. In so many ways, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. But he did so much more than that too. Jesus never gives up on us. He understands our pain. He shows us love. He is alive. He can be trusted. And he gives us a mission. All right, good morning, church family. Good to be together here on Easter Sunday and just to worship together and see each other's face. Isn't it great to see faces? Man, I tell you what, it's so wonderful uh, just to be together. So we're gonna be jumping into Luke chapter 23 here in just a moment. 
<clears throat> you can open your Bibles or turn on your mobile devices, however you choose to read Scripture, and go to Luke chapter 23. We're going to be looking at the very end of that chapter because we want to cross over a little bit from last week. But for those that may not have been here over the past couple of weeks as we've been going through Break Trail, our series, Easter series, I want to make sure we're all on the same page so we can understand and grasp what we're learning today. So the very first week, we looked at this big idea that Jesus never gives up on us. That week, we learned that Jesus was betrayed by two of his disciples for sure, outwardly, vocally. Uh, we know of Judas, that one, he was even referred to multiple times as, as Judas the betrayer. And that, that became his title. And we know actually of Peter who denied Jesus. Sometimes we look at that and we say, well, Judas was the bad one because he betrayed Jesus. But Peter, he just denied him. Both betrayals. Both betrayals. The, the tragedy, of course, is that Judas did not give Jesus an opportunity for restoration. And Peter actually did. You see, Jesus never gives up on us. He never gives up on you. No matter what anything you've done or gone through, I hope you'll hear these words that he's not done with you and he doesn't give up on you no matter what. The week after that, we looked at how Jesus knows our pain. We went through a really a painstaking walk of the journey of Jesus on his way to the cross. We talked about some brutal things that scripture records on his beating and the lacerations and his journey to the cross, and the way that he had to endure all that. Jesus knows our pain is what we talked about. Now, Jesus didn't need to walk through the cross and the, and the pain to understand us. But because he did, we can actually relate more to him actually knowing our pain because of what he did. Do you understand that? He already fully knew because he was God. But the thing is, is that we have a hard time grasping that concept of 100% man, 100% God, how does that work? Jesus knows your pain. The stuff you've gone through, the stuff you're going through right now, you know that thing right now that you wish was gone, that you're glad that we're here today, but you know it's waiting on you? He knows your pain. Last week, we looked about how Jesus shows us love and the death on the cross brought it all together. That's why he said, it is finished. And so we looked about how he gave himself as an act, like a sacrifice, like a legit sacrifice for our sin. He took our place. What we deserved, he took. You see, God treated Jesus the way that we deserved to be treated so that he could treat us the way that Jesus deserves to be treated. And so that's how he showed us his love. And so now we're, in, this, we're in, the, in the part of the story where Jesus has been, we're gonna read through some of the scripture again. Jesus has died on the cross and he has been taken off the cross and put into a tomb. That's where we ended it. And I've been talking with people throughout the week and I go, hey, man, what do you think's gonna happen on Easter Sunday? Like, let's talk about the story. Now, you know as well as I do, many of you have heard this story multiple times times. You've heard the Easter story. You've heard about the time that he, that he, that he was, that was beaten and he was put into a cross because he died. He was put on a cross. He died, put into a tomb. And then we talk about the resurrection. You've heard this before. Here's what I'd like you to think about as we go through this today. Most likely there won't be a whole lot of new information, maybe, but there won't be a whole lot of new information, but I want you to ask yourself this question as we go through it today. What has kept you, if this is true, what I'm gonna tell you, if this is true, what has kept you from giving it everything, from really jumping in? What is holding you back from believing it even for the very first time? So as we go through this today, I want you to be thinking, what is standing in my way between giving it everything I've got or even giving it anything for the very first time? Today, we're looking at how Jesus is alive. 
And we're going to be looking into Luke chapter 23 as we see what's going on here. Now, it was very customary in the days of the Bible for people to go and visit the tomb, the grave that somebody had done, where somebody uh, was buried, three days after they had died. And there was preparations that were done and ways to be able to honor the body and also fragrances that would kind of tame down the smell after a period of time. So it was very normal for them to actually go to the grave a couple days later. Most likely what we're going to read, it wasn't because the women were like, oh, it's Easter Sunday, right? It wasn't an Easter Sunday thing. And so it wasn't like they were anticipating going to the tomb and believing in that point, like, oh, of course he's not here. That wasn't the case. They were on their way to the tomb to do what everybody did, to prepare the body that was dead. And so as we read here, let's kind of see where this sets us up, a little overlap from last week, and then we'll go into 24. So right now, Luke 23, verse 50. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. Basically, that's saying that he was very upright and honorable, man of good character. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he did not agree with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He was anticipating, along with all the Jews anticipating, hey, there was a Messiah coming. The difference is that many of the Jews didn't believe that this was the Messiah. Many believed that he, was, he should have been born in Jerusalem because there should have been a huge military powerful takeover and to establish that brand new kingdom, expecting a huge takeover. And here you have somebody who is coming like a lamb to the slaughter, and they're not, really un, they're not really grasping it, even though the scriptures that they had been studying from birth was indicating this, was talking about how this was how it was going to look. But they made up their own concept of how this huge military leader was going to come in and just rush through and take over. And so here we have Jesus Joseph is watching and saying, man, I'm expecting his kingdom to come. Maybe, just maybe, he was wondering, could it be? Could it be? He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now, customarily, the bodies uh, that were crucified were actually left on the cross, and animals would kind of uh, pick them off little by little. But Passover was coming. This was so nice of them. Passover was coming, and so they didn't want crucifixions along the road, and so they made sure that everybody was taken down and everything was removed. And so it was a very quick pro. Listen, these guys aren't dying fast enough, so let's go ahead and get them because the sun's going down. And once the sun goes down, it's now Sabbath, Passover begins, and we are going to have to stop working. So we got to move this along. And so here we see that, they were go that Joseph went to go say, hey, can I, can I have the body of Jesus the, Naz the Nazarene? And so they said, yeah, you can, you can take them and take them down. So it was very common, again, a common experience, um, for an uncommon individual. Then he took the body down from the cross and he wrapped it in long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. Now this care for the body of Jesus was most likely done very quickly. He died later in the day and by the time that they would have been able to go and get permission and actually take the body down, they, they would have been getting close to dark. So they probably did whatever preparations they normally would do and they did it very, very quickly and put him into the tomb. But they had to stop because it was the Jewish law. They could not work at that time. So it's highly probable that it just wasn't done exactly the way, which, which is another example of how things just weren't done to add to any sort of healing. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So verse 55, as his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. And so here we are, the end of Luke chapter 23, and they had taken the body down, they had taken Jesus down, and they were moving him to a tomb. And the women followed them to see where, in fact, they were going to be burying Jesus. Because they knew that in three days, they were going to not see a resurrected body, but to actually go and prepare the body three days later later. So they went home in that time, they were preparing what they needed to be able to go back, but they needed to know where the tomb was. Very significant 
uh, bit of information to learn that they knew where Jesus was actually buried. Now, let's get into today's passage, Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at a few verses here, and we're going to walk through this together. Luke chapter 24, and I'm going to have them up on the screen as well, so you can follow along. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It might be slightly different than what you're, what you're reading from, uh, but these are consistent here. So, um, very early... So Jesus was placed in the tomb, but very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared. Now that very early was very early. We're talking about three or three to five a.m. So we're talking about a time that's still dark, that you're just trying to like muscle through whatever's happening, and they're just trying to get there. It's dark, and uh, they're trying to remember exactly where they were going. I can't imagine they forgot. Wait, where was that tomb again? Right, because it was a dramatic, you guys remember where you were, generational here, okay? Do you remember where you were when you heard that JFK was shot? That image just popped to your head. You don't remember. <laughs> Do you remember when you saw the first plane hit the first tower? Right, so these moments of impact that are like so shocking to our psyche, we have these instant memories where we will always Remember, most likely, always remember where we were, where we were standing. Um, even if you don't remember some of the details of what you were wearing, irrelevant, but you remember that moment. Some people were sitting in school. Some people were at home. Some people were in different places. This was a situation where their Messiah, the one they were putting all their weight on, everything was on him, and they see him die. Wait, that's not supposed to happen. Even though Jesus explained it multiple times, hey, I'm going to die, I have to die, and then I'm going to come back. But they saw their Messiah, their friend, her son, die. You don't think for a second that that wasn't burnt into their memory as they're walking behind those that are carrying Jesus? And so moms, picture this for a moment. Right? I don't even need to say more because you can already feel if you were walking behind your son and you're just walking to that place, you understand that you're not going to forget where you were. It's just burnt into your memory. And so here we are. They're taking spices they had prepared, which shows us they were not expecting a body, a, a resurrection. They were not expecting a resurrected Jesus because they brought spices they had prepared. So all weekend long, they were working on these spices, getting it all together, and they were on their way to actually prepare the body at this time. It's interesting. They saw the, the big stone. Let's talk about the stone for a minute. This was incredible. Huge stone that was in sort of a crevice, right? So like a crevice here. Maybe a raised area here, raised here, and it sat down in and kind of rolled in. And then once it rolled into position in front of the, in front of the carved out tomb, it would, it was, so it's going along, and then it would go down into a dip, and it would sit down inside of this extremely heavy stone rolled into the place. I wonder if they even thought, how are we going to move the stone? Right? You just, sometimes we don't think. We just do. Story of my life. You're just like, did you not expect? No, I really didn't. I really didn't think of that. I just, and so that's why, uh, husbands, we get married because the women say, did you not expect that? And we can say no, and then they forgive us, and then we move forward. Sometimes that's flip-flopped, but in my case, it's not. So they're on their way. The women are on their way to the, 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 the tomb, and I don't know. Maybe they expected the soldiers were going to do it. Who knows? But they carried these spices in anticipation to prepare the body. Now, when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in. I wonder how long that took them, right? You go up to the tomb where the one that you've been following for three years or so was supposed to be buried, and it's open. And I, maybe they look in, and you just, will you go check it out? Let's go together. I don't know. And they find, check this out, listen to this. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They go in, and it's gone. Now, let's take a moment. We're going to look at Matthew's account of this as well. Luke gave us the details that he had, 
and that he wanted to share, that God gave to him and he wanted to share and that God wanted in his gospel. But Matthew has more detail because think about this. These, these ladies, these women went to the tomb and we know from scripture that there were Roman guards that were placed to guard because they were placed there because they had heard that, oh, he claimed to be the Messiah and he's gonna be resurrected. You know what? We can't allow for that to even be an appearance. So let's put guards there so that nobody comes to steal his body in the middle of the night. So they put roughly four, maybe six guards. These were tough dudes. These, were, these guys were actually guarding the tomb with their lives because if anything went wrong that wasn't supposed to happen, the Roman government would kill them. They would lose their life over the way that they behaved, how this happened here. So they were guarding it with their very lives. So where were they? Matthew tells us. Check this out. Matthew 28, starting in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. When I see that idea that, he's, he's, that the angel sat on the stone, it almost seems like, not arrogance, but like the power. I'm sitting on the stone that you tried to block the Messiah in. Nobody sees that? Read your Bible. Sometimes you just wonder, well, why would you sit on the stone? Kind of neat. So he sits on the stone there. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear. So these are the Roman guards that were in front of the tomb that were, that were guarding it. And here's what happens to him. The guards shook with fear when they saw them, when they saw them, and they fell down uh, into a dead faint. They passed out. They saw the, they saw the angels. It moved right on their face, man. So you had these four, maybe six Roman soldiers, these really tough dudes, and they passed out. Now, they didn't fall asleep. They basically got knocked out, right? Like, woo. And so the ladies approach, and this is what they see. So we're gonna go back to Luke 24, starting in verse four. As they stood there puzzled, two men, angels, suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. Can you imagine the shock that these women must have experienced? Because this announcement does not make sense. What I'm about to read you, they don't quite get right away. What I'm about to read you is a contradiction of what's supposed to happen. Listen to this. The women were terrified and bowed with their face and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, here's the statement. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? That doesn't make any sense. We came with spices and we came with whatever oils. We came to prepare the body. We're not looking for someone who is alive amongst the dead. We are looking for someone who is dead amongst the dead. Right? So I'm trying to comprehend what are you saying, men in shiny clothes? We're, we're doing what was right. You're not making sense. But the statement is exactly all Jesus stuff. This is Jesus' statements. When, when you love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, feed your enemies. He says wild, crazy things. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Make it, it's going to look like you actually hate everybody else by the way you love me. Who signs up for that? But these are the things that he said. So this goes right in line with his whole life and his whole existence wait, what? Why are you looking amongst the dead for someone who is alive? And then, then it goes into this statement, he isn't here. He is alive from the dead. He is risen from the dead. Exclamation points. That's a big deal. He did, it wasn't just a passing of information. These angels were like, he's risen. He's alive. He's not here. Could you imagine being these ladies or being people standing there going, wait, what? And they're still not getting it just yet. He is risen. Remember, 
So the angels are now reminding these women something. Listen, remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered what he had said. This is why it's so vitally important for believers, followers of Christ, to gather together on a regular basis. This is why it's so important for us to come together because we forget. We forget that that terrible thing that you're going through right now is not the ultimate plan for your life. That the hardship that you're experiencing right now is not the primary focus of the world. We need to remind each other that, hey, he is risen. And the early church would say, he is risen indeed. And we would say that, they would say that to each other over and over and over again to remind each other. That's why we do communion, so that we can remember. If you spend so much time doing life on your own, you're gonna get to a place that makes sense on your own power. I talked to a gentleman yesterday and I said, have you been doing life on your own this whole time? Yeah, I've been working really, 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 really hard. And I say it with, with just gentleness and I say, how's it going for you? It's not going good. How about we try something else? Let's try following Jesus and let him guide you along the way. Doesn't mean it's gonna be easy but it will be significant. It will be profound. We need to be reminded, church, of our hope. We need to be reminded. That's why we're here today, to be reminded that, hey, he is risen. risen We need to be reminded. And the women needed to be reminded at the tomb that day, oh, he did say that. To us, we're going, well, that's just silly. How could they forget? There's a lot going on. And they were seeing all kinds of unique things. And they remembered that he had said this. Verse nine, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Now, this was in their mind, they're going, okay, let's go tell the 11 because we know Judas is already out of the picture, but it wasn't even the 11. It ended up being 10 of them because Thomas wasn't even there. You know, our friend Downing Thomas uh, no, for real, let me, let me have more proof and more proof and more proof. And so he went, they, they were heading back now and ended up ten, telling about 10 of them what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, uh, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. Check this out. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. So they probably didn't believe it for two reasons. One, they were women, no offense, but in a culture where the court system would not recognize the eyewitness of a woman as a valid testimony, the culture was to the understanding that you then could not trust the account of a woman. That could have been one. Secondly, there's no precedence for this. Yeah, the other people made sense because Jesus did the healing and the resurrecting. But for Jesus to raise up himself to conquer death, nobody has done that. And so to them, they're going, that's ridiculous. But my buddy comes through. Peter, the excited one, you know, the one that's like, oh my gosh, I'll die for you, Lord. I don't know the guy. You know him? However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. I could just see it now. This is nonsense. Peter, where, where'd you go? He's gone. He's gonna check this out for himself. Because what if? What if? He runs to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again and wondered what had happened. Let me give you a picture of what went down here. He went up, he's looking, he peers inside, and he goes home, and he goes, hmm, what did I just see? What did I just not see? What just went down? Could it? Maybe? No. 
And I could just imagine the whirlwind of thoughts going through their mind as he's trying to process all this stuff. Now, there's a reason why the resurrection is talked about every single year and even times throughout the year. Because without a physical, real, resurrected body of Jesus Christ, all of this is nonsense. None of it matters. It is, Christianity is no different. Following Jesus is no different than any other faith because everybody else that, that has come that said, oh yeah, I'm the real one, I'm the real one. Every, uh, he's the only one that said, take this, kill this temple and in three days I'll raise it up and he did it. You take that out and it doesn't matter. Even the apostles would say our preaching's in vain. There's no point. We're wasting our time if there's no resurrection. So if you don't want there to be a resurrection, you have to come up with other, other explanations on why the body was not there. So let's walk through a couple of these real quick to kind of see, well, what are people saying? Well, it, within scripture, we read that uh, they were actually, the Roman soldiers were paid to say that while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. Absurdity! Because if you understand what was going on in the Roman culture, they would have never admitted that they fell asleep. That alone could get you killed. And then to say the disciples came while you were sleeping and moved this incredibly uh, heavy stone that was in a, in a crevice there and kind of dipped down in, and they were going to remove that in such a way. I can't imagine these disciples were very tactful. And so they walked up in a very silent stealth mode, moved that. One of them just stood there. I got the door. Then the others went in. <laughs> and why would they unwrap the body? That makes no sense. Why would you unwrap the body to remove the body? You would just take it the way that it is and get out of Dodge as fast as you possibly can. And then they would just leave it there. Okay, so now we're just going to keep this propped open and we're going to go while the Roman soldiers were sleeping. It's absurd. Every one of those Roman soldiers would have been killed, possibly crucified. They would have never, they would have never admitted it if it was true. But when somebody pays you and you've got coverage, Hey, we're good. We can say we fell asleep. Nobody would have fallen. No, nobody would have bought that. It's ridiculous. They would even think to try to say that. But they were desperate because with a resurrected body, now we have a Messiah. But they didn't want a Messiah because they liked their way of life. And they did their way of life very, very well. Honoring all 613 some laws. We are such good people. They wanted to keep going that direction. And Jesus said, no, we're going to flip this kingdom upside down. The first is now last. Pray for your enemies. And they're like, nope, don't like that. Because then I have to spend time with sinners. And I like spending time with people who are not. That's not so absurd. We say those things. You know the people that look different than us, smell different than us, act different than us? We do the same thing. We want them to stay over there while we stay here in our comfort. It's no different. It's really no different. And so we have this concept that maybe the disciples stole the body. Well, maybe the Jews stole the body. Why in the world would the Jews who were saying, crucify him, steal the body? Why would they have any reason? Because if they did, then they proved all they would have to do later is to show the body. See, not the Messiah. Why would they keep a secret for something they didn't believe in? Does that make sense? You're going, well, that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. But when you're desperate to cover up the truth, you'll come up with ridiculous things. Ridiculous things. Maybe it was the wrong tomb. There's a theory that goes around that says, you know what? They probably just went to the wrong tomb. Okay, so let's process this for a moment. Okay, so the ladies that were going, went to the tomb, okay, so when they came back, they went to the wrong tomb. Okay, maybe a couple because it was dark. Okay, I'll give you that. All right, so then when the, when the disciples left where they were, because in different accounts, John actually records that John, he says funny things like, uh, you know, the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. He's talking about himself. And he talks about how John and Peter went running for the tomb. Oh, and by the way, John says, I won. John, who cares? Who ca 
I can only imagine that, the, that, that the, our heavenly father just kind of, he's writing this and, and God goes, John, John. All right, not going to change the story. Doesn't matter. Let's go with it. Not to say that, that God doesn't have complete sovereignty over scripture. He does. He inspired this. Maybe he's showing us his humanity. And so they run to the tomb. That's to say that if it's the wrong tomb, John and Peter and all the women and the disciples, they all went to the wrong tomb. And what about Joseph? Well, maybe he had the right tomb or maybe he didn't have the right tomb. It was his property. He knew where his tomb was. And what about the officials? What about the high priest? What about all these people that went to go see it for themselves? Did they all go to the wrong tomb? What about the angels? What about the two glowing guys that were sitting there on the rock? Moved the rock, sat on top of it, must have gone to the wrong tomb. Weird. People will come up with desperate things to cover things when they don't want it to be revealed. And then one of the final things to share with you about like a theory, something known as the swoon theory, meaning that Jesus didn't actually die. He couldn't have died. Here's the theory. And I don't mean to be facetious, but when you talk about silly things, it's hard not to be. So a uh, swoon theory, Jesus really didn't die. Let's just talk about this for a minute. Um, so after, after a, a, a night of desperate praying, right? Sweating blood. After being beaten to such a degree that his own mother didn't, under, didn't recognize him. We walked through all of that the past couple of weeks. If you didn't hear that, go back and get onto the podcast and just re, re, you know, relive that a moment and see where that is. And then after going through excruciating beatings, you know, on the way to the cross, when he was carrying the cross beam, the 75-pound uh, railroad tie headed on his back, and, and he fell down probably multiple times. He couldn't do it under his own strength because his body was giving out, and they had to get somebody else to carry it. Okay, there's that. Then they put him on a cross from, what, 9 to 3? And he's hanging on this cross. And the Roman soldiers went up to him at one point in time because it was getting late and they didn't want him on there any longer. So the two criminals were still alive. So they broke their legs so that they would suffocate. And they looked at Jesus and said, oh, he's dead. Oh, maybe they got it wrong. Not the Romans. They may not have invented crucifixion, but they perfected crucifixion. They were very good at killing people. Very good. Very good at the, the whole concept of torture. They could look and say, that guy's dead, yes. But just to be careful, go ahead and spear him in the side and pierce his heart. Today, if your heart gets pierced, it would be incredible to save that. Then uh, the, the idea of medicine what is a little different. And so when he was put in, so the swoon theory goes as such, he would just passed out. And when he was put into the grave, over three days, the moisture and the, the scents and the aromas or whatever that was in there, and also the clothing, the, the wrappings, helped his body rejuvenate just enough that he was able to get up on his own. And in one of the accounts, it actually shows that the facial covering was folded. And then he went over to the incredibly difficult to move uh, heavy stone, moved it out of the way, and walked out. Roman soldiers, remember? Still there. So if he's just a man, and somehow his body rejuvenated and he walked out, would they not have been able to overcome him? Just look at it. We're going to put our faith and our belief system in something. Why not put it in something that actually makes sense? Truly, truly, what actually makes some level of sense and has so much historical support, both within Scripture and accounts outside of Scripture. Scripture that shows that there had to be an empty tomb. Because of this report and this report, it doesn't make sense. Why would they do this if they do this? If you're going to live a lie, remember I said that all these women came from the tomb and people didn't believe them? If you're going to do a lie, you would never have women share that because they, nobody would have believed them. They wouldn't have believed them in that day. And so they would have had multiple men sharing this, but they didn't. They just, they just did exactly what was, going, what was organically occurring. The women shared it, so I told you the women shared it. Here's how the Apostle Paul talks about this, the idea of this resurrection and how significant it is. 
So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. So we know about the first Adam of creation, and then Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. As sin came in through one man, sin is now conquered through one man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But here is an order of, uh, to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will return, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. If you are frustrated with rulers and authorities of this country and around the world, just wait, believer, because there's hope. Jesus is coming. He will be overthrow it all and hand it over to his Father. I have done what you have asked me to do. So if you believe that the rulers of this world are your enemies, Jesus said something crazy. Pray for them. Pray for them more than you talk about them. Pray over them. Ask God to grip their heart. Call them to repentance. Only God can. Something only God can. And it is going to change. It is going to be different. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. <clears throat> and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's something to believe in. That's something to live for. That's something to trust. Because death is not the worst thing that could happen to a follower of Jesus. Acknowledging Jesus as the son of God and then denying him is much worse. Death, physically, absent from the body, means to be then present with the Lord. It's not the worst that could happen if you follow Jesus. It doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, no. In fact, Jesus even said, count the cost. There's nothing flowery or fluffy with the gospel, I'm sorry. If I have ever indicated such, or if anybody else has, let me give a resounding, I am so sorry for it to be made so light and fluffy. Jesus himself said to a crowd of people, hey, your life needs to look like you hate everybody else compared to how much you love me. And they all walked away. Count the cost. Count the cost, what it means to follow Jesus. Now, at the core of our faith is the belief that God can turn death into life, redeem anything that's gone wrong, and resurrect anything and anyone. He truly can if he chooses to. My prayers these days sound something like, Lord, if you're willing, I know this can happen. If you're willing, I believe that no matter what you do, is good. No matter how my life looks, this is a part of your plan, and I'm going to trust you. So let me ask you this. Remember at the beginning, we talked about what's, what's standing between you and just giving it all? It probably has to do with the fact that you're desperate to have Jesus breathe new life into some area of your life. If you're not following Jesus yet, that's the first step. That's the first step. If you've been following Jesus for even a time, maybe you've lost hope in some situations. Maybe you've lost hope in your faith, life's purpose, relationships. Maybe you've lost hope in the church of Jesus. You know, last night I came here because I wanted to walk through and I wanted to pray over thing here. I was having some moments of praying. I like to pray out loud. People probably would walk in and be like, dude's crazy, but I'll get into it. And we'll just, I'll just talk into my father. And he showed me the difference between where I was about three years ago, where I had lost hope in just serving in the ministry. I had lost hope. Many of you know that I've shared that at that time I even resigned 
It was a different, different organization, different setup than we are today. I had lost hope. And I remember walking around here going, why don't I want to go home right now? It's not my family. It's not because I don't want to go to my family. But I just couldn't wait for us to do this today. I couldn't wait for us to be together. I couldn't wait to say, hey, two years ago, we were online. And then here we are two years later, we're all together. COVID, what? Like we are here and we are, we are serving God. We are serving each other, not being served. This is what it's all about. Maybe you've lost hope in the church. I get it. Because the church is the people. But here's what I'd like us to do. Have a moment of prayer together. Will you bow your head, close your eyes? I just want you to have a moment of prayer by yourself. I want you to think for a moment of a situation that you desperately need Jesus to bring life into. What is that situation right now that you're thinking about? I want you to think about it. A simple prayer of, God, I am desperate for your life in this area of my life. Perhaps maybe it's you're desperate for God to bring any life into your situation. Talk to him about that right now. You guys can stand with us and worship. They wept, the morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen, his body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon you. The Son of God was laid in darkness of battle on the grave. The war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not your sting I'm resurrected King has rendered you defeated forever He is glorified forever He is lifted high forever He is risen
death is overcome He overcame, he overcame the grave We sing hallelujah We sing hallelujah We sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome come on let's sing it out we sing hallelujah we sing
Amen, people, huh? Yeah. All right, have a seat for just a moment as we wrap up here. The big idea for today is rather simple. Jesus is alive. Like, that's for real. It is for real. You're going to believe something in your life. You're going to believe something. Why not believe something that has eternal value? Now, that doesn't mean that it's easy. I don't want to paint a picture that makes it seem like it's all gardens and rainbows. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul talked about this, because this is hard. People count the cost on what it actually means to follow Jesus. Romans chapter seven, Natalie read this a little bit ago here. He says, I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Can you relate? I wanted to do the right thing, but I did the wrong thing. I love God's law with all my heart, Paul says, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. What humility to acknowledge what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? This is the Apostle Paul. The one that started all these church families, spread it all over the place, missionary work. He says, I am a wretched man. He says, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sin nature, I'm a slave to sin. It's not easy, it's a battle, it's a war but it's so significant. It, goes, it takes us from death to life. So how do we take this narrative? How do we take this story? How do we take this teaching today and like make it practical? Well, here's our next step. How many times do you think that you've heard this Easter story? Once a year for your life? <laughs> At least. Maybe you've heard it just a couple of times. Maybe today's the first time that you heard that, wait, Jesus is the Messiah. He died for me and rose again. So I gotta ask, if it's true, if what you're learning today is actually true, if what we are giving our life to is for real, if Jesus really is alive, what's one thing this week that you can do to respond to that truth? Well, you don't have a response if it's not true, right? But I just have to ask you, if it is, what are you going to do with it? Well, that's the thing about grace. You get to choose to believe it or not. Let me have a moment and just pray over us as we head out here today. And as you count the cost this week, Father God, you are our Redeemer, our Savior, our strength, our power, our resurrection and our life. Thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for making us new creations in Christ the moment we accepted your son as savior. Thank you for the victory and power we have in your precious name. No matter what life brings our way, we can look confidently to you because you hold the keys of death, which means we are alive in Christ. Jesus made a way for us to live a life of freedom from sin. Thank you that he made that way. We praise you for the love you lavish on us. May your light shine brightly on us and through us. May we make a difference in the lives of others by sharing your truth. Thank you for such an incredible gift. To you be the honor, the glory, and the power forever on this resurrection day. And all God's people say, amen. People be encouraged. Will you stand with me, receive the blessing of the Lord as we head out here today? I pray 
that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust in him. Say it with me. Go and be the church.